roster. You look at it like the eight or nine guys, you're like, okay, they mm-hmm. maybe a mayor and may maybe we're betting uh, betting against themselves to bring back Kyrie Irving and pretty hefty. I don't even think it's the price for me. It's more mm-hmm. the the three years uh, okay. for Kyrie Irving in the year of 2023 is bold. Uh, yeah. is probably the adjective I would use. But you trade for him at the deadline. You can't lose him for nothing. You have to bring him back. I think there's just no alternative, especially with Brunson going the way he did uh, last year. You kind of you're kind of locked in there, and Kyrie probably kind of knew that. That like you you guys really need to keep me around. Lauren, are you feeling good now that the dust has settled a little bit over the last? I mean, just the flurry of offseason moves. Um, mm-hmm. The Suns just added twelve guys in the span of forty eight <laughs> hours. Like mm-hmm. it's been really really insane trying to keep up with everything, but. Now that you've had some time to think about what the Mavericks have done to this point, do you think they are moving in the right direction? Are you overall pleased with the, what the Mavs have done? Yeah, I, I am pleased. Uh, I think, you know, there's there's always room for improvement and they still have more to improve upon for sure. Definitely still big questions that they need to answer. But overall, with what they've been able to do in terms of even going back and kind of you know, quote unquote, tanking the last however many games you want to mm. call it uh, to make sure that they did their best to keep that pick and then ultimately doing what they did on draft night, bringing in both Derek Lively, the second and Omax, two guys that I think that they're really, really excited about um, starting there with your off season and then bringing back Kyrie, which I think a lot of people felt pretty confident that was going to happen, but also bring a, a guy in like Seth Curry and even Rashawn Holmes on draft night two guys that give them flexibility to, if they want to go out and move uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. or Reggie Bullock or Maxi Kleba or any of these guys that have value on the market. I don't want to say a crazy amount of value, but value to potentially put together or go out and make a move. They now have guys that can kind of step up and they're not just completely thin, worn thin in certain spots. So I think they're doing a good job at transitioning from this time of having these al- multiple albatross contracts and really limited draft assets to still somewhat limited draft assets but they're they have this young group that they really like uh and they have their top tier talent what that means for Kyrie's long-term future you can never be too sure but right now I do think that they feel good about where they're at and I feel good about where they're at to start the season and I don't think that they're done this offseason that would really shock me they still have their MLE money which we're going to see what they do uh but even as far as trades go I'm still keeping my eyes out there for sure who makes the most sense for the mle for them right now who's available i'd say probably grant williams um but i'm keeping a sleeper on grant williams yes is he a good fit there i hadn't thought about him Eh. in dallas uh you know i think that there could be better fits but Mm. i think right now given the current market and i mean he i do think that he's a decent fit um i just think that he has interest they have interest and they like the youth the energy the shooting uh Mm. i think that there is interest there uh I'm also keeping a sleeper eye on PJ Washington. I expect him Hmm. to go back to Charlotte, but he is a Dallas kid. Uh, I do think that he's somebody that they could also have interest in. I'm, I wouldn't put that too high on my, my board of, of likelihood, I guess, but uh, it's something that I'm keeping an eye on. Yeah, for sure. Interesting. So with Kyrie back in the fold, Mm -hmm. um, obviously with Hardy, is he going to be a significant role player in Hardy? Yeah, is he? I think so. I do because um, I mean Seth the Seth Curry makes it a little bit difficult because Hardy's Mm -hmm. not like a true point guard, uh, but he does have. They want to get him the looks. He's he's Mm -hmm. shown that he can be a volume shooter. He can heat up. Uh, He's good attacking the basket off the bench. He's just kind of this spark. Uh, So I do think that they're going to try to make out, make sure that they carve out more minutes for him. Uh, But obviously Seth Curry is going to get a lot of looks too, because they want the shooting there. So I'm not sure what that means for Tim Hardaway Jr. I think for this team right now, you can never have too much shooting, but making sure that Hardy gets the opportunity to develop and learn under someone like Kyrie, who you can definitely see him sort of kind of emanate or, uh, uh, implementing aspects of Kyrie's game into his own game. I think giving Hardy that that opportunity and that kind of role to to continue to improve and kind of explore what he can do with this team and how far he can really go is something that they're definitely – is high priority on their list for sure. Rather than Grant, mm-hmm. Brooke Lopez is someone that I think would actually be really fun in Dallas. Yeah, you know, I would have loved to have Brooke Lopez. I think he was just out of their price range. Yeah. I don't think that that was going to happen, but – um yeah, I mean, I was surprised to see him, to see the dollar amount that he went yeah. for. But I do think that, you know, for Dallas specifically, trying to find that 
kind of rim protecting defensive minded big is something that they would really have interest in. And I think there's going to be that I think is what's priority number one on the trade market for them for sure. That's what I was thinking. It's just like that. Like when you say Grant Williams, I'm like, I, you have Reggie Bullock, you have Tim Hardaway. You're mm-hmm. so ball dominant anyway um, with Kyrie and Luca. You play, you're probably, uh, uh, you know better than me, Lauren, here. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I'm going to assume that they're going to continue to play at an extremely slow pace. They're not going <laughs> to, they're not going to flip the script here and start being the run and gun sons. Um, even yeah. though Michael Pena was making a good point on the ringer, it's like, I don't understand why Luca doesn't push uh, yeah. more. Maybe that is something that the Mavs should lean into more. But I just wonder with that kind of pace, like you want, two shooters and grant williams i love grant but he doesn't and you already have josh green who's going to be getting significant minutes um, yeah. for this mavericks team that you want to be kind of careful because it's like everything comes down to the geometry of the court right and like who puts pressure like that was something that the hawks ran into over and over again um where i'm like i'm frustrated with the geometry of the court where john collins if his fingers not facing the right <laughs> direction and we have clint capella on the court we are at a significant disadvantage especially with yeah. Dejounte murray who is a very league average three-point shooter so spacing was tight and it was rough but that's not to say those players individually were not good. But when I look at Dallas, I'm like, I just, they need the pick and pop big, not the pick and roll yeah. big. Christian Wood is not the answer. Um, I think that's asking a lot of Derek Lively right out of the gate. Um, and he seems really, really green to this point. And watching him at Duke, like, I I just, I would not expect uh, immediate anchor big sure. uh, DeAndre Ayton style uh, <laughs> from Lively right out of the gate. So I'm like, who who makes the most sense? Like, is there a way to package christian wood for somebody else to white pat like i don't i don't mm-hmm. know who because brooke lopez obviously isn't an option so like who is right. the realistic option it's not john collins it's not clint capella <laughs> right. people keep throwing out clint capella until mm-hmm. trey young is no longer a hawk that man is going to be an atlanta hawk yeah i i think for dallas a lot of those pick and pop realistic targets are just not there for them i think they mm-hmm. would have loved to have a guy like miles turner i don't see him he would be he's great. not available he's not available right he's like the ideal guy he's mm. not available did i lose you guys you did no oh, you're okay so sorry am i back yeah am i back you're back okay Whew, fingers crossed okay yeah i mean miles would have been great uh i think that there are a lot of guys out there that are not necessarily the pick and pop targets but that could be guys that dallas looks at in terms of just having the defense and the rim protection because i think the ideal again the ideal version is a defensive minded guy that can pick and pop but we just that guy out there on the trade market Actually, let me let me jump back a little bit. I do think that Dallas getting that starter level big is only something that's going to happen mm. ultimately via trade. But I do think that as far as the ideal version of that, it's not out there right now, which is why I do think that they still have interest in guys like Jared Allen. I do think that they have interest in Clint Capella, but neither of those I don't I just don't see happening right now. I would, you need a shooter, right? Would you rather want a that, rim running? Would you? I just I just I would like, rather have a rim running, defensive minded, athletic big that's closer to seven feet tall than yeah. um, more shooting. I I, I mean hmm. definitely that's the idealized version. But for Dallas right now, they have not had the athletic seven foot rim protection that they need. They yeah. really just have had. Well, they haven't had that. They have had some switchable defenders kind of over the course of the last couple of years, especially with like Bullock, Dorian Finney-Smith, Maxi. Mm. Those are all solid defenders, but they're not what they need. That's They're still missing that piece. And so, like you said, I completely agree that that Derek Lively this second, it's probably too early for him and you can't put that, up, that pressure and that expectation on him. Um, but as far as going out and getting that guy, I do think that it's going to have to be something that gets achieved via trade. Um, and so whether that be this summer or at the trade deadline, uh, I think that that's, that's something you can pretty much pencil in. What do you think, Corbin? Are you a fan of what Dallas has done to this point? I mean, I think considering what they did last year, like, I think, yeah, you kind of have to be, mm-hmm. you know, like exactly. there is at least a plan. And yeah, maybe some of it is just by like acknowledgement of they were, kind of limited by their options you know like mm-hmm. yeah you, you kind of let you know one guy go you couldn't really let Kyrie go and mind you I mean he didn't really have as much leverage as I think he thought he did I mean having him with the Suns come on now like you know like mm-hmm. this is fun but at the same time you know like there is at least a step in the right right in the right direction in terms of building a team around Luca and in this case Kyrie that will work moving forward and I, I definitely am of course in agreement with what Lauren said about like finding the right piece in the right big I mean you know, you, you got a guy in Derek Lively who I think is intriguing, you know. Um, 
you definitely want to figure out kind of in between the margins there for sure. And like Lauren said, they're probably not done. So that's great. Um, but yeah, I think that they've done well. I mean, they actually came with a plan and not just, I mean, come on. Remember they're like, Oh, we have, you know, Dorian Finney Smith coming off the court and, you know, Tim Hardaway Jr. could be off the court. And, you know, like, like they, it was, it was horrible last year. Like they were just kind of like the piss and, and telling you is raining type thing on like, Oh, we don't need a backup point guard. We're good. And then, you know, wiping off the mothballs off Kemba Walker. Like, that was last year. Right? That was their punishment for Rick Carlisle doing the three-point guard system for uh, with you know, and Kemba. You know, I was just yeah. watching some 2016 Mavericks Thunder, and you are right. Like, let me tell you. You had, like, <laughs> you know, you had Darren Williams, you know, you had Raymond Felton and Devin Harris. And, and, Devin yeah. Harris, and they were <laughs> lighting him up. I was like, oh, snap. He yeah. loved that. And then Dwight Powell and J- Justin Anderson. Shout oh yeah! To, shout out wow. to him. I don't know the how the lefty assassin. Those you, those units were like Dirk's Twilight years, which just makes me kind of sad. But anyway, yeah. Um, you know, anyway, they won the game I was watching, so it didn't matter. But um, but yeah, yeah. No, I, I think you you kind of have Corbin and now like he's just going back to like when I was watching the Thunder and uh, the Mavericks from six years ago. Like... Listen, it's been a long off season already. Yeah. No, <laughs> but no, it's been great. I think that they're on the right path. And mind you, I don't know what that means. Like playoff contention for sure but i thought yeah. they are they better like, like playoff contention if they're not that then we have I mean, a major the problem is starting to tick exactly yeah. so, definitely ticking definitely. yeah but i i think i mean hopefully we'll have it it seems like a drama free off season so far that's more than can be said mm-hmm. for the last couple of years in Dallas. that's for true sure. i because they obviously i think they would have been a playing team if they wanted to make the playoffs last year like i think that might have that probably would have ended up happening like the mavericks i mean we'll never know for sure but yeah they're right there Next year, though, the thing about the West is, and now when you look at the East and West right now, it's unbelievable. It just seems like time's a flat circle. Did you hear about this? Did you see this? Uh, the East is terrible at the bottom, and the West is just the worst team in the West. Still, it's going to be a fun, pesky league pass team. Like, the worst West team might be Portland, and they might be a lot of fun and have some quality veterans to play. Like, they are just going to be a hard out if uh, Dame is ended up moved there. But, like, I just look at this crowded conference, and I'm like... Two years ago, this was a Western Conference finalist. Last year, they missed the playoffs altogether. Mm-hmm. They have the best offensive player in basketball, I think, right now, in Luka. 